Right. So I, I think we would start our town hall meeting, which I explain in a minute, with a very nice thing to do. And this is a short procedure in revealing who received the ISS 2021 10 Years Impact Award. And for that, I hand over to Mark Hancock, who is the steering committee member um, of the ISS steering committee. Mark, please go ahead. Hi, thanks, Raymond. Um, so uh, I wanted to introduce the, the awardees of the, the 10 Year Impact Award. Before I do that, I just wanted to explain a little bit about what the 10 Year Impact Award is. Um, and so it's given uh, to a paper from 10 conferences ago uh, when the conference was at the time called Interactive Tabletops and Surfaces. And so that was ITS 2012. And so we go over uh, the papers from that year and we choose uh, the most impactful paper from that year. Uh, we've struck, we struck a committee to review these papers and uh, from that year we review the influence each paper has and determine which one had the most impact, both inside the ISS community and outside. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to announce that the winners of this year's ACM ISS 10 Year Impact Award are, uh, Lisa Anthony, Quincy Brown, Jay Nias, Berthel Tate, and Shreya Mohan by, from their paper, Interaction and Recognition Challenges in Interpreting Children's Touch and Gesture Input on Mobile Devices. Um, this is a very important award that we give out at ISS. It's uh, the one that, that looks at um, more impact than just this own year uh, of uh, the conference. And so just to give a brief overview, this paper presents uh, results of a study that was investigating how children use touch and gesture. Um, and the findings show that these systems don't effectively interpret what children intend to do. Uh, and they had things like many holdovers and misses uh, when children touch and low recognition accuracy with gestures. I unfortunately don't have time to go into a lot more detail about the paper, uh, but really everyone should just go back and read this paper because it's a really great one. And when I went back and read it myself, I, I really enjoyed doing so. I think you would as well. Um, but there were many competitive papers this year uh, with many high citation counts and significant impact. And the thing that made this paper stand out from the pack uh, was it was very highly influential both uh, in this area uh, to subsequent, subsequent work, but also um, uh, outside of HCI as well, for example, in the field of education. Um, and we thought that was particularly important. Um, and at the time of the publication, uh, the authors of this paper were at uh, the University of Maryland in Baltimore, so UMBC and Bowie State University, but they, uh, each of the authors, I think, has moved on uh, to other universities and industry jobs. And so I wanted to kind of introduce uh, the, the people that are here uh, and able to receive the award, um, uh, because IS is happening in a hybrid way, uh, in person in LODs as well as uh, virtually everywhere else. Um, we are for fortunate to uh, virtually have three of the five authors with us. Um, so I'll ask them to each just say hello and wave <laughs> uh, so that you can see who they are. Um, and so the first is Lisa Anthony, who's now an associate professor at the University of Florida. Uh, so Lisa, if you could just uh, Hi, wave. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, and then Quincy Brown, who is now a senior director for innovation research at anitaboard.org. Hello. And then Jay Nias, who is now an assistant professor of computer science at Spelman College in Atlanta. And by the way, I'm getting most of this from the internet, so correct me if I'm wrong about any of these details. <laughs> Perfect. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Good. Uh, and unfortunately, I think Berthel Tate and Shreya Mohan couldn't join us. I'm, I'm right about that, right? They weren't able to, to make it to the call. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, but I'd like everyone to please join me in congratulating all of the authors for this wonderful paper. And I wanted to give uh, a brief opportunity, um, and don't feel obliged, uh, Lisa, Quincy, or Jay, uh, to, to say much at all, if anything, uh, but we'd be very interested to hear any reflections you have on the state of touch and gesture with children in today's uh, research and products, uh, at, or anything that you think might be relevant to us as a community based on the research that you've done. Um, but also, as I mentioned, don't feel obliged. I'm putting you on the spot, I know. Uh, so feel free to just say thank you very much, <laughs> uh, and that's all. So go ahead if you'd like. <laughs> um, I can say a couple of things. Thank you so much to the committee for um, for recognizing this paper, and of course to the community for citing us and and recognizing the value of this work. I think ten years ago when we did this paper, um, it was a paper I was pretty proud of at the time because it was my first paper after grad school. I had met Quincy at a conference workshop, we sat next to each other, got talking about research and 
And then we were able to do research together, get a grant funded and write some great papers on this area, which was really under um, attended to in the literature at the time, quantitative understanding of children's touchscreen behaviors. But in the time since then, it's really grown a lot um, as an area for, for focus. And, and I think that's just a testament to the spread of touchscreens and the importance of considering all users and not just sort of the typical stereotypical user. And kids, you know, all of our research starting with this paper showed how different um, kids' input behaviors look from adults. And it's not enough to just give them a the same device or the same algorithm and expect it to work. So I'm really proud of this paper. For any students or other junior researchers in the audience, you know, I think this paper got rejected at least twice before it was accepted. It was really improved a lot through the review process. And I remember being proud of it at the time. So I, I really just can't express how overjoyed I am um, that this paper has had such an impact. Thank you so much. Yeah, let's give another round of applause. <laughs> So yeah, I, uh, Quincy or Jay, if you want to say anything, go ahead. But I, also, again, you don't need to. You can just pass. That's OK, too. Uh, the, the, the only thing I'll add, um, it's great to see JD. So I guess we haven't been in the same room together in, in many years, um, is that so I don't, I don't do HCI research directly anymore. Um, and so I work in the policy space. I'm actually um, now as a senior policy advisor at the White House, Office of Science and Technology Policy. And I think you know when I was reflecting on this paper and the work that we did, it's, it was really about understanding like the people, right? And in this case, they were children and how they are and aren't being considered in the design of technology. And I think that it's, it's, it's I just wanted to say that, you know, people who are doing all this work, especially students can think broadly about how they can use all of the skills and all of the knowledge and just the way they think about approaching and solving problems, right, can be used in so many domains. And so I just think when I send those words of encouragement, because as Lisa said, this wasn't the first time, and it took us a little while to get this this paper and other papers on this work published. But the the field has come a long way, as has technology, right? And so I think there's a lot to be said for that, and I'm appreciative as well. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. That's wonderful to hear, and I I, I think that's a really great message because uh, I know I've been in that boat before, where a paper. Uh, has been rejected a few times before it gets accepted, and sometimes it's a lot better after that happens. Um, and uh, I really appreciate hearing that story. Uh, and I also, when reading the paper, found that it just seemed like there's so much in that paper that is still relevant today. Um, and so I, I think that's really great to see. Um, so congratulations again, and we look forward to seeing what impact this work will continue to have in the next 10 years as well. Uh, so thanks again. And I'll pass it back to Raymond for the rest of the town hall meeting. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot also, Mark, for moderating that. And also, uh, congratulations from the entire steering committee as well. We are very proud and happy to uh, give you this award. Well, what is the town hall meeting, actually? Um, I think, um, of course, this, this is not the town hall you see here. And town hall meeting means that you have the opportunity as a community, as participants of ISS, be it virtual or be it uh, in presence, um, to utter your um, opinions, to make suggestions, to improve the conference, and basically to get engaged with um, this conference, interactive services and spaces. And uh, we are um, a steering committee. That means we take care a little bit of an, like an overall um, overarching organization of this conference series and QUC's members. Um, I'm currently the chair in this year of the steering committee, Craig Anslow from New Zealand, Mark Hancock, you have just listened to him from Canada, Hideki Koike from Japan, Bong Shin Lee, who is also present today from Microsoft Research USA, Miguel Center from Canada, Anne Odo, and um, Edward C. are the current steering committee members. So please, you might know um, some of the people, just try um, to approach them whenever you have a question. And of course, um, if you do not know any of these people, don't worry, 
uh, still approach us. So we are very open minded and uh, would like to hear your feedback and your opinion. So today, basically, um, before I, I open the round of questions and discussion and answers potentially, uh, I would like to encourage you to visit um, our website as well, iss.acm.org. So you see here, this is like an overarching conference website uh, where you always you always see the upcoming event, like to, um, this year's ISS, but also you have uh, access to the history of the conference and see also who the steering committee members are. By the way, we are always looking for people um, who love to participate, who love to engage uh, um, and to yeah, bring in their knowledge, their um, experience, and of course, also a little bit of time to work with us. So please approach us if you uh, feel like this would be good to, to yeah, work on the organization of this conference and to improve it. One point that we would like to quickly talk about before we come to the questions is still the new um, uh, PACM, PACM um, model. So it is a journal model. And maybe I hand over to you again, Mark, to just briefly summarize um, what we currently experience. And of course, then to hear your feedback and your experiences with that new journal model. Okay, thanks again, Raman. So uh, I'll just briefly kind of discuss what this is. So uh, this is the second year uh, that our conference has used the PAC and HCI model for publishing. Um, and so this is a journal um, uh, model of reviewing rather than the, the um, traditional conference style review. And we actually have two rounds of reviews. Uh, this was the first time we've done the two rounds of reviews this year. So one in the beginning of the year around February and then another one in the, in the uh, typical kind of summer round, we call it. Um, and what this means is that we have kind of uh, several possible decisions uh, you can have in a paper and we can actually accept it just like we would have before, but we can also do ma minor or major revisions. Uh, um, major revision would then be submitted to the next uh, deadline, whatever that happens to be. It could be this year's uh, ISS uh, um, or, or the next winter or summer round, uh, whatever it happens to be. Um, we also now have an editorial board, which is what used to be called the program committee. Um, and we have uh, sort of an extra uh, paper chair uh, so that two, there's always a rollover of one person from uh, one uh, round to the next. And so there's always two people organizing it and uh, one person that has uh, been involved in the process in the past. Um, so uh, I think I want to kind of open the floor uh, to, to everyone to let us know what your experiences are like with this new journal model, uh, positive or negative, um, or, or <laughs> neither positive nor negative. Um, and if you have any suggestions for us to improve the process in, in any way. And feel free to use the chat uh, to ask questions or to, to um, just unmute your microphone and ask if you're virtual. might be that we do not even have, I don't know whether we have authors of um, this year's conference um, among the audience. For me, just to say that I have a very small screen, so I, I don't see everything like the participants and chat and everything. So sorry for that, because I'm um, not at the office currently. All right. So uh, therefore, uh, yeah, maybe are there questions from the audience or people who have made good or not so good experience with the journal model? Rina, you would like to say something or? Uh, yeah, I just wanted clarification. So is it that if it is published in ISS, what, uh, when the conference deadline is upcoming, what happens when it's past the current year? It, uh, that's a good question. And so uh, basically if it's either accepted or with minor revisions uh, in any of the rounds for the current year, uh, then you'll be invited to present at the conference. Uh, and uh, the, the invitation to do that is actually optional. You're welcome to decline that invitation if that's what you prefer. Um, and in some um, countries that it's difficult to make your way to a conference or pay for the fees. And so there's there are supports for helping that kind of thing as well if you do want to do that. But if it's impossible, then uh, it's still possible to publish in our journal. Um, but if you uh, have major revisions, uh, then in, if that was in the, the summer round, uh, then you would be invited to uh, resubmit to the, the next winter round. 
uh, and that would be for, uh, for instance, if that was for ISS 2021, you would be invited to submit to ISS 22's winter round. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. By the way, if you still have questions later on, so you don't, if they don't come to your mind at the moment, but maybe in a couple of days, um, you can also reach us. So yeah, of course, uh, looking at um, our website of the steering committee, you see the contact address there. So and feel free to email us or approach us differently. So it's no problem. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we can already move on a little bit and uh, of course if you still have questions you can also uh, always throw them in so basically it's all about you it's about getting some feedback um, of course um yeah any problems you were facing maybe suggestions for improvement for the next years and some of the topics we would like to briefly discuss with you a little bit is of course this tension between virtual versus in presence versus hybrid conferences for the next year and um we don't reveal where it happens. I think this still is uh, one of the points um, in this conference. I hope I, uh, I'm on track here. And then, of course, uh, also we would like to discuss with you whether you would prefer, for example, um, co-locating this conference with another one. This is a question we are asking for a couple of years already because it's a big step, uh, whether we would like to, to make it a little bit bigger, for example, by co-locating or even joining other conferences as well. So these are just Examples, of course, you can ask any questions if you like, or we can discuss any issues you might came across, might have come across. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'd also love to hear, by the way, um, maybe there was someone talking, I apologize if I interrupted, but I, is, um, I'd like to hear the, uh, and if anybody has any responses to these topics, but also just what was the experience like in person at LODS this year, because I was unfortunately unable to come. Um, how did it go from that side of the hybrid model um, uh, versus the virtual one, which I'm experiencing right now? So hi, uh, Christian here. Uh, this year's papers chair and also a workshop organizer. And I must really congratulate the organizers of this conference for the technical setup. It was absolutely flawless up to now. I was I was really impressed with the quality of holding a hybrid workshop. That was quite an experiment for us. And uh, nonetheless, it was seven or eight hours even that we uh, pulled through, and it was a really good, really good workshop. And I was really impressed with the quality of the setup and how well, in the end, this hybrid format had worked. Um, it, of course, is a bit of an experiment. So a lot of things are probably things that you need to try out and, and then find out. And probably we'll, we'll need some repetitions before you really know what, what, what the perfect way is to optimize it. But um, it was really a great experience. And um, so I think from a perspective as a workshop organizer, I absolutely can say that hybrid works. So uh, that is, I think, uh, uh, a very uh, an important insight. And I was actually very skeptical uh, on the morning when I arrived here. So so the, do you think of, you only have like half an hour left before the, all of the workshop starts? And you think, okay, there must probably be so many things to solve with the techn technology and everything was really fine and very well organized and I, I really want to thank the organizers and the tech staff that they that they made this possible, and that was really really good. Yeah, yeah. I can all I can only join join you, Christian, in in thanking the organizers. This is really great that you managed this hybrid conference. This is really astonishing, and I I certainly think that a lot of work has gone into that. I mean, one of the on the other hand, on the downside, a little bit of this hybrid conference is, of course, that you always have to make, yeah, these are the organizers. So <laughs> um, on the downside, you you have to um, make compromises as far as time zones is concerned. This is a little issue for people who are virtual and, of course, um, in presence. So this is not so easy, I would say, for some people. For example, um, Craig Ansel from New Zealand is not able to, to make it just now and uh, hopefully sleeping and you see so these um 
these are maybe some of the issues which are not so easy to handle. And we had that at CHI, where we had a hybrid conference, sorry, a virtual conference with three time slots uh, distributed over the entire day, um, which is of course good for letting people from all over the world participate, but this would not go together with a hybrid model, then this is a disadvantage there. So everything has some yeah, pros and cons, obviously, here. Yeah, if I can chip in, I mean, first, thank you so much, Christian. We, 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 we sort of, I saw the initial skepticism and I saw you smile and that was amazing. Uh, but uh, I think one thing that I don't think we're going to have a solution here for this, but something that we should, and I'm looking up because that's where I see you guys, by the way, hybrid experience. Uh, but one thing that we should, we should address here, and I know that some of you have been asking us here, is sort of like the fact that this conference can happen in a hybrid way also comes at a high cost of resources. And it's not... Uh, it's a fact that this conference is not cheap and we should also uh, discuss models in which we can make it more financially accessible for other people because the reason why well, sort of, well, there's a camera pointing at me is that we had to pay for this. No, totally agree. That's that's certainly a point. If you just if you just do it virtual, then you can uh, significantly reduce the costs, obviously, and um, this is obviously um, then an advantage. I, I understand that, and of course, uh, this way it's a bit expensive for both uh, the um, presence and the virtual participants, and especially for students or people with less funding, this should be supported. That's right, mm -hmm. or improved. We'll point the camera at Christian again. Uh, yeah, no, just to add briefly, maybe this, uh, this would also be an argument to consider when uh, talking about co-location, because maybe costs could be shared if it's co-located with other conferences, because the infrastructure costs will be then shared by multiple conferences, which might be a positive side of co-location. I mean, there are always ups and downs for many things. I'm just, uh, that's just my first thought when I, when I think about that question. That's right. That's that's a good idea. You're certain. I mean, I mean, even of course, even if you uh, if you, for example, make the effort of traveling to a country to a conference site, then of course it's more worth um, spending all the efforts and time. And you know, um, it's not just about your financial budget, but it's also about our climate budget in a way. So this could of course be helpful to to join or co-locate conferences, That's, but it's not easy, by the way. Uh, so feel free, of course, to maybe either yourself or maybe your colleagues, supervisors, uh, friends, um, to propose conferences. And this is also, I mean, conference locations potential and maybe with which conference you could imagine co-locating as well. So this is, of course, always dependent um, also from the personal, yeah, engagement and of people who devote time and energy to to make this happen so in that sense uh, we will soon send out a call for bids for future conferences so if if you um, have the feeling that uh, this would be good uh, for you or um, you know people who might want to organize a conference please let us know that would be great <laughs> If I may contribute a student perspective on the hybrid format, uh, basically, uh, I believe that what this conference like goes in and the effort paid to organize it is actually money well spent because what I earned and learned through all those uh, semi formal encounters here in the in presence formal with for all these super experienced members of community uh, and of, of the community is actually invaluable. And I believe those interactions would not have happened in a fully online format as I experienced in past Sekai events. I mean, this, of course, being there in presence is always good i mean just heard it uh, a few minutes ago from uh, the 10 years impact or rather the authors met physically and uh, chatted about their um, research and so uh, they decided to work together write a paper and finally won this um, 10 years impact award so this is a very good example of that impact you can have um, from a um, physical meeting
yeah, feel free to just, yeah, Rina, maybe you. I was gonna say that from an inclusive diversity and equity perspective, I really like how the virtual conferences can accommodate more people. Um, you know, when we ha add this hybrid part to the in-person. For me, I felt like the only part about the virtual conference that um, hasn't yet been solved is the social aspect. So I really do miss seeing all of your faces. Hi, everyone. Um, and that's something I'm sure that is you know, resonating amongst other people too. But when I went to the Kai hybrid, um, you know, social events with like the group team chats, it wasn't really the solution or wasn't similar to walking into, you know, the break room and seeing a group of people and coming up and saying hi. So I would love to hear about, you know, anyone's experience with these, you know, social parts about the hybrid conferences. And um, especially if anyone's used anything like um, a game space meetup where you have kind of, you move around or any sort of cool technology for it. I mean, it's quite some conferences have used Gather Town, for example, or other virtual meetings where you have the ability to create um, a space which looks a bit old fashioned, so like in a game, as you know, but of course you can decorate it, you can extend it, you can walk around with your small avatar, you can even play games, virtual games, you can have like some secret meeting spaces and everything. But I think most of you know Gather Town. Uh, that's one of the op opportunities. And so I think that's quite fun and interesting. Even so, it's not completely replacing, of course, <laughs> meeting people in, in, in person, that's fine. But up to now, this is one of my most interesting experience. I, I also once had um, a VR conference already a couple of years ago, which entirely happened in virtual space. So um, it was just in virtual reality, but it was back then in Second Life. It was also fun, um, and, but in a way similar to Gap Town, just a bit more three-dimensional. I would expect that a VR conference definitely has to live up to that. Yes, it really was uh, some years ago, like 15 years ago, so it's a long time. They tried it out back then. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, there are a couple of games you can play, like online games and uh, so like Zoom games and so on. Yeah, of course, this is not really the same. It's, maybe it's a way to, to chat a little bit with people and to, to do something together. So that would be an, another option for social life. I, th I think I'd also wanted to point out that in uh, ISS 2020, uh, we did use Gather for some of the social events. Um, but not for the main event. Uh, the main event was done in this kind of Zoom call. Um, uh, but I think that there was a bit more of a, a willingness to participate in that. Uh, it, and maybe there still is as well, um, but uh, I don't know what that will be like in the future, uh, whether or not people will uh, be as accepting of uh, the sort of compromised <laughs> uh, social experiences that come with virtual. So it's another thing to consider, I think. I do like that you see and hear different people in the virtual platform. Like that's something that, you know, is an, I guess I want to say an advantage over in person is that uh, we really have the ability to like take turns and, and hear everyone's voice in one conversation. Um, but again, I think there's also that sort of shyness that, you know, oh, being on, uh, you know, this platform sort of, or, you know, having, an open stage can be kind of hard, especially when you see lots of presenters in the chat, but maybe don't see all of their faces present or know who's there behind each of the screen. So I think that's something that might be kind of interesting to like try and counteract that shyness. Also, um, of course, then 
if you, you would be able to to reduce the costs for online participation, that would be another important issue because then it would be really easy to register just, I don't know, for 20, 50 bucks, whatever, which almost every student, a PhD student could afford, certainly. And um, that would, of course, uh, also uh, lower the barrier a little bit and uh, yeah, the entry. Um, hurdle, let's say it like that. So that would be good, actually, in a way. So I think we should, as a takeaway, I think Pavel, sorry, Pavel hinted at that already. It would be good um, to try to, uh, it would be good to try to reduce the costs for online participation, also to allow these social meetings and meeting more people. I think it would be great if we could buy a license for the lab. And everybody in your local lab gets to participate yeah. via that one, um, I guess, participation. Um, I think that I've seen that before with people with the telepresence robots and sort of people gathering all together um, and sort of watching Kai and controlling the robot. It gives an opportunity for people within the local lab as well to kind of socialize. I don't know how that would work in terms of cost. But if we are um, able to share like the bigger cost but for the lab and accommodate more people per you know, registration, then that could be something that really helps get more participation and inclusion. Yeah, that's certainly a very good idea. Yeah. I just recently experienced it for the visualization conference. So I also met with some 14 people together and we watched some sessions together locally, basically, which was very good. It was a very good experience, yeah. By the way, maybe to add, you, oh, sorry. No. please. Uh, sorry to cut you in, Raymond. I think that's something for the steering committee to actually consider. Because from our end, uh, there's two things. First, most of our virtual re registrations so far are going unused. So we actually have really good registration numbers, but most of these people haven't shown up to the conference. So I think there's sort of there's a certain kind of a burnout. People just may have had enough of Zoom calls. Is one thing. Uh, but the second thing is. Uh, and that's sort of that's why I'm re-raising this point is we've actually investigated briefly the possibility to sort of to have a group uh, participation. This is currently impossible due to Sikai policy because you have to accept waivers for participation and so on. So it would not it is currently not possible. So that's something that you could perhaps raise with the executive committee to make a policy that will actually enable that. That's a very good point. And of course, as an intermediate step, you could even say there's one person who is responsible, like the group leader or any anybody who pays a higher fee and um, in turn is allowed to share the link basically or to, to show it in the lab or so. That, that, that would be maybe an intermediate step for that. Or maybe that's yeah. a volunteer. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, perhaps that if we have somebody who enforces a good you know, code of conduct, um, and sort of mediates and sets up the session that we call them a virtual SV and provide some benefit for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just don't know how that would work in terms of um, registering the entire group. Like if they were to hold, for example, like a local ISS and then um, everyone sort of calls in from these groups, like from these individual parties. But again, balancing cost and code of conduct and legal policy, I can see that being a challenge. Mm -hmm. Maybe a question to Pavel, are there also just virtual student volunteers at your conference at the moment, or is it basically in presence uh, student volunteers? I, I believe our virtual student volunteers are not only uh, here, but they're also hard at work because they're captioning all the sessions so that we can make them available on YouTube and available in an accessible way. And that's a big benefit of a hybrid conference because they are in different time zones. So as we sleep, they will process the videos and in the morning here, you'll also, you'll already be able to access all the videos in an accessible way. Yeah, thanks a lot. These are very uh, important issues we have to consider. Yeah, anything else? Any other thoughts you would like to share of this conference?
of this content. I don't know. Um, Pavel, do we have a restriction? You said something about uh, the room is only available to an, uh, up to a certain time. Is it true or just that we don't um, run into troubles here? I mean, what I see is most people have, because we have to sort of stop serving drinks at half past, and I see. most people here have, they have already gone to the drinks. Ah. Uh, <laughs> we are very happy okay. to chat more, more with you. Uh, yeah. in this lovely format, but most people are already drinking because yeah. uh, we have to we have to close the building at nine. <laughs> I see. Okay, no problem. Yeah, as I, I, I don't see the entire list of participants. It seems to be quite low at the moment. Of course, we don't have to extend. Uh, yeah, too much. Yeah. All right, but thanks a lot. Um, also for discussing Rena and colleagues and every. But we said and uh, yeah. Yeah, we just we just want to show you the room here so that you can experience that a bit. Uh, it's mainly empty at this point, but at least this is Andre, the other general chat that you meet, and Christian yes. is over there. And uh, yeah, we of, we sort of we're sorry that you can't be here, but at least we tried to give you a little uh, glimpse. And as as you can see over here, like everyone has a microphone, so we are really as hybrid as we possibly can be. Yeah, no, this is really cool. I saw that already in the morning session uh, today. I was quite impressed that everyone really has their own microphone. This is just amazing, really cool. Mm -hmm. Looks quite professional. Yeah, <clears throat> very good. Yeah, so thanks a lot for participating and please feel free to approach us at any time. And also thanks a lot, Bongshin, for participating from the United States and Mark from Canada. And we are very glad yeah, to, that ISS 2021 has started so successfully and we wish you good luck for tomorrow and the day after.